The following is a comfortably zoned radio network production. Thank you, Tally Olson. I am back. Comfortably zoned with the zigzag man, the token Jew, token with an I in Alameda, California, right across the bay from San Francisco and across the moat from Oakland. Um, as they've set it up here in uh, charming Alameda. It is uh, a good day to be alive, 75 degrees, and um, I've got a returning guest who I am so excited to have back. Um, Dan Karuba, how are you? I'm good, Ralph. How are you? And uh, thank you for inviting me back. And you know, brings me back to the days, like I mentioned to you before, living out in San Francisco and having lunch at Red Java's house or going to the bus stop down in Union and Laguna for a beer and watching New York sports on TV at 4.30 in the afternoon during the oh, week. That was really that, cool. It was right at the uh, start of cable TV, if I... Yes. Um, and you got New York... Uh, New York met baseball on WOR in those yep. days. And yes, uh, that was my first experience. Um, I grew up in New York, left in 1965, and uh, came out here. I so missed the Mets. I so missed New York on certain levels. Not enough uh, to bring me back <laughs> but other than to visit. But um, they were great days for you in the Bay Area. And um, I want to talk to you about something um, that evokes great days for both of us. We, okay. are, both, we are both minor league baseball uh, aficionados, uh, get to spend time in the minor league system. I... Um, as a lot of my listeners know, and I, I was explaining uh, to Dan off the air that I was the tops representative, tops baseball cards on the West Coast, covering the Northwest West League and the California League for wow. 13 years in the 80s and 90s. And wow. um, I have incredible memories. Uh, when I share them with people who are not ex who are not familiar with the minor league experience, they don't go, "Oh wow, oh wow," like you did. And mm. um, very few people are are aware of the splendor of the minor leagues. And mm. um, I'll let you start, Dan. Tell, tell us about how you got involved. You're kind of a renaissance man. You've done it all, Norm, Norman Rockwell Museum. Um, and you're also, and have been for a long time, an usher in a minor league, in a minor league experience. Tell me how yeah. that got started, what that's like for you. Okay, well... Um... I lived up in Maine for a number of years, uh, six, seven years up in Cornish, Maine. Um, and then my daughter um, had a young child and uh, she lived in the Kingston, New York area. So my wife and I had also some family relatives in Hyde Park, New York, near Roosevelt's home. And we decided to move into the Albany, New York area as close to an airport as possible. And, um, for me to travel, and we found we 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 got on the east, uh, the west side, excuse me, the east side of the Hudson River, in a in the area of Kinderhook, New York, and um, uh, this is about uh, seven seventeen years ago, and um, um, all of a sudden, about a year later, I decided to go to a minor league baseball game in Troy, New York, and it was the Tri City Valley Cats, and it was the minor league team uh, short season A ball which starts in mid-June and ends in the a week or so after uh, Labor Day. 
And uh, it was a minor league ballpark at, on the campus of Hudson Valley uh, Community College. Uh, Joe Bruno put the whole thing up. He was a senator in, in, the, in the state here. And it's a beautiful 4,500-seat stadium and upper deck with, lux- with box seats and everything. And no, no charge to park. And it was easy to get in, get out. So I went to a game or two, talked to some of the ushers because I used to usher at uh, Shea Stadium for a while for some of the Met and Jet games. And a year later, I asked if I could uh, usher there, and they said, sure enough, and um, this is my 15th year at the Joe, and we are now in independent baseball league in the Frontier League because of what this commissioner, whose last name begins with, uh, begins with an M, did yes. for minor league baseball, and we were in the New York Penn League. So there were teams from Lowell, Massachusetts, uh, Auburn, uh, New York, um, Pennsylvania, um, you know, all, Brooklyn came up, the Staten Island Yankees. A lot of these teams um, were part of this 70-year-old league, which is now destroyed by the commission whose last name begins with an M. So I, I is, also there. This is my That is a travesty, year. incidentally. Um, the New York Penn League is as close as you can get to the Northwest League, in, uh, in Oregon and Washington. And what they do is welcome the new signees, some out of mm-hmm. high school, most out of college. And um, it's a very well-respected short A league because it starts up after the draft every year and, or mm-hmm. it started up there after the draft every year. And um, it gave the tops rep a chance to sign these players to contracts that guaranteed paying them when they reached, when and if they reached the major leagues. Mm -hmm. And I'd go up there and I'd have pens in hand, checks in hand, $5 checks. They called it stake money. And yep. it, w- it would obligate the players and in turn obligate the company, Tops, to use their picture, like I say, when and if the kids made the major leagues. And, and now, now, you know what, now uh, there's a lot of guys that come in uh, to the ballpark here uh, in Troy that have sets of baseball cards with these minor leaguers already on a on cards and they get these autographs of these younger players like Justin Dunn. I think he pitches for, uh, for Seattle. He was signed by the Mets and he was involved in a trade, I think two years ago. And you should have saw all those people come up and, tr- and get his autograph uh, on these baseball cards. And, um, you know, it, it, it it's a shame that, um, these these leagues have been split up, but they still have the minor leagues, less 40 teams. And, man, you, you had a wonderful experience in doing what you did and meeting these young players. They were oh, even – it was – you have stories I bet you, you can talk to people for hours on. I, I uh, wrote a book, literally, and uh, um, yeah, I talk a, a, a lot – about I featured a lot of the players and coaches that I met, mm-hmm. the roving coaches, the guys that yes. in the organization that were teachers, former major leaguers when I was a kid. Mm-hmm. And I befriended a bunch of them. Um, I'm not going to single out anybody other than uh, Mark Littell, who mm-hmm. – um, I instantly had a rapport with doing doing the tops, and he was nice enough to do a forward for my book. Oh, how um, cool is that? Yeah, uh, incredible. Uh, yeah, we we uh, had some players, too, where we had uh, – who's now the uh, first base coach for the St. Louis Cardinals, Stubby Clapp, and, and he was our minor league manager for two years, Ed Romero who played in the 1986 World Series with the Boston Red Sox, was our manager for two years. And when we won our last championship 
2017 of the New York Penn League, a young gentleman by the name of Jason Bell was our manager. Now, this guy, will, he's with the Astros. He was an analytics guy. He was um, over the minor league system uh, for a while before he came on manager. And now he's doing a, a, the work uh, in, in, in field minor leagues uh, for the Astros. And that's one gentleman you want to keep your name out to is Jason Bell. What a great individual he is. Wonderful guy that, that, that he is as, as far as a manager. And he really got a lot out of the plays and training and stuff like that. And, um, you know, there are some other coaches in Major League Baseball that were part of our team. Um, so it, it's nice to see their growth as well. And, and for the people to come into the minor leagues, the fans and making fans for life, that is really cool that I didn't know much about until I started to work here uh, at the Joe. Oh, and you see, you, you see the fanatics come back. Mm-hmm. The ones yeah. that have not only autographs, but stories to tell with each other about Mm -hmm. who they saw, what they were like at the time. Um, And you hit it right on the the head. It's not only watching the players develop, it's watching the coaches and the managers and the Rovers and all these guys, how they either go up or down in the minor league system. And sometimes when you go down, it's good because the best managers and, and coaching staff with in minor league ball are assigned to the the first year leagues that we both followed. And That's, um, that's very true. And, and you know, um, Rich Gedman uh, managed the Lowell Spinners for two years, I think. And right. Algado Alfonso was the head of the Brooklyn Cyclones. For a and long now he's time. With the, yeah, he's with the Staten Island Yankees, which is in the indep- another independent league. And, and you know, um, Nelson Figueroa down there is their pitching coach. So... Uh, and when when, and when uh, God Alfonso came up here, he couldn't be the nicest man and talking about baseball in the Mets and for the Mets not to have him under their umbrella now. I mean, that's, that's my opinion is, is really um, strange as to what happened there. But what a wonderful individual to talk to. And then you, you're, I have a picture of me and Brandon Nemo in, oh, in, wow. in my Usher's uniform. And same thing with Mike, Mike Con, uh, Conforto, um, uh, uh, Kevin Plowicki, because I'm a Mets fan. So these guys would come up and then to meet Jose Altuve at the airport when he first came up here. And he learned English with the Houston Astros, had this thing, English as a second language. He would be in the mornings in, in class, uh, English as a second language taught by a, a Spanish teacher up here in school, and she would have the summer off, so she would teach the, some of the uh, Spanish ball players English. we go into the classroom and work with them. Um, you know, when George Springer got signed by here, he came to the t- team, uh, J.D. Davis, who with the Mets now. The so, Mets. Like, yeah, like you see this, like you saw it, and I can name a, a whole plethora of players that really made a big difference. J.D. Martinez came up here with the Houston Astros, and and he played one summer here. And, and you know, Seth Beer, who's playing for Arizona now, he started out with a major league home run, first time up, won the game. And when he would come up for the for the Tri City Valley Cats, everybody would go, "Hey Beer, hey Beer," and it was just <laughs> really cool. It was just just wonderful minor league baseball um, and to see the fans the young kids meet the players and after the game some of the players come up at pine home play for our team and it's just remarkable to see how they relate to the players and the, and the players in this independent league and or when we with the astros really went out of their way to make an impression on these young kids 
You know what impresses me about minor league ball is that there are families in these um, entrance league um, teams that players don't have a lot of money, and there are families that take them in. Correct. um, uh, And the experience that they must get from um, having them guest uh, the player's guest, good, bad, or indifferent. Uh, no one's perfect, um, but that must be great. Do you know of any families who have done yes. that? Yes. Tell uh, me about it. Actually, the, I don't know their last names, um, but there was one or two or three players on the Valley Cats last year um, who had relatives up in and around this area. So they stayed with them, and a friend of a friend took in another player. And you you see this by um, most of the time when the Astros were here, we would have um, a complex on the campus that would house students in the wintertime. And when our team was ready to go, they were out of school, so we put them in these dorms. And it was just right on the campus. They walk over to the stadium and stuff like that. It wasn't too much of a drag. Um, and some of the guys had cars and stuff, so they were carpooling to certain locations in and around Troy, New York. But, right. yeah, uh, it's, I, I, I know of families that have taken players in, and I, um, I've heard many people speak about, especially I think it was the Lowell Spinners that, did, that, that took in some players and families up in Lowell, Massachusetts. So that's not, um, that's not a, a, a unique thing. It's it's something that if a player wants to do this or a friend of a friend knows a player, here, stay with this family, no big deal, and you can do that. So, yes, it was done uh, not as much as years gone by, but it's still being done that way. Wow. Um, you have explained the minor league experience better than I can do. Um, really? Me, no, yeah, you, you know absolutely. your stuff, man. Yes. Well, you know your stuff too, man. And <laughs> <laughs> I, you, I think you, I, you, I, you know what? You know what's? I don't hate to interrupt you. You know what's really cool? In the 15 years that I've been part of the Valley Cats, they've had interns and people that were full-scale management staff with the Valley Cats over these 15 years, and a good majority of them are now in other um, venues within Major League or Minor League Baseball or in head offices down in in New York at the Major League Baseball level that have done so well. And we've had um, a number of people that have stayed with the Valley Cats in management staff positions for years and years and years. And people only see from the time the stadium opens up to the time the stadium closes how well they work. It's the winter time, uh, ag- acknowledging the fact of who you're going to sponsor next year, selling, uh, you know, parties for the Bill team. Boards, billboards and stuff, scorecards, yes. Yes. scorecard advertising, and that's what makes a minor league franchise go. It, because yep. um, the head teams um, take care of – the incidentals of a player and what have mm-hmm. you. But it's like a mom and pop operation at that level. And uh, they've got to make a business go. And they depend depend on interns. And, um, Correct. and what also fascinates me is everybody who's involved with this type of thing, love it. Uh, yep. uh, no, nobody goes to work every day and says, can't wait for Friday. Mm-hmm. <laughs> that type of, oh, we're off tomorrow, don't have to work. Yeah, no. it, 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 some, some of the stuff is tough. You know, they got to clean the stadium at night and be ready to go for the next day. Um, they're getting things ready in the morning for the food, pro- for, for the concession stands. They're ordering stuff for the beers and sodas and whatnot um, and, and, and the food challenges that, that go into ordering. 
And, you know, all of these incidentals that, that work because it's, it's also the major league for them because it's the first time they're doing it and they're getting paid for it. And sometimes the interns work uh, to, to learn their experiences. And then you got the sections, like, uh, for instance, I'm in section 120 and 140 at, at, at the Joe, and I'm between home plate and the dugout. And in these sections are like neighborhoods because everybody <laughs> knows everybody. You know, they come back. They, they say hello to you. They see the fans that have been season ticket holders or partial season ticket holders. They're there a, a lot of the times every game. So they're, they're interacting with each other. They're cheering for each other. They're kidding around. And, and it's just like a little neighborhood. Section 120 has its own neighborhood. 140 has its own neighborhood. 160 and so on and, and so forth down the line um, in left field, in right field rather. So it, it is a, a, a complex of, of not only the fans, but the players that are earning their keep and learning. Um, you know, with Stubby Clapp was here, he had some great coaching. Joel Chamelis was a hitting coach. And now he's the hitting coach uh, for the um, Syracuse Mets in AAA. And he's from Brooklyn. And uh, every time I would see him, I'd go, hey, Brooklyn. And he knew who it was. And, and to see his progress uh, from a hitting coach in, in, in short season A ball all the way up to the Mets AAA farm system is really cool to do, see that. And I'm so happy for him. Okay. Um, who is – your favorite all-time person, not necessarily the player, person that you met doing this? Wow. Um, well, um, <clears throat> Bill Gladstone was the owner of this team. He passed away about two years ago. And he was a wealth of information. He was the accountant for the Brooklyn Dodgers down on Montague Street in Brooklyn, New York. He was the head of a big accounting firm, and he was on the board of directors up for the um, Baseball Hall of Fame. And wow. to talk to him about the process, they were over, the team was over in Pittsfield, Massachusetts, at Wicona Park. It's one of the oldest parks in the United States. And for some reasons, they, they, they couldn't get together on maybe the new field or something, and, and with the new stadium here, Bill Gladstone, along with Rick Murphy, who's been with this team for over 20 years, uh, formulated the team here. Uh, there was a scout, I can't think of his name, but he, was, he came here at 90 years old. He had a driver. He was a scout for the Baltimore Orioles, the Atlanta Braves. And I, I can't, because I, I got gray hair, I forgot his name. He was <laughs> such a well knowledgeable um, uh, scout. The scouts that come in here, John Matlock was over here for a while. Oh, and, and I, then met he, him in, I met him in the minors in the Northwest League. Yes. Um, and he, he, was, he was traveling as, as a scout. Um, and, and the ball players that I met, um, Joe Musgrove was really cool. And I met his parents here. Uh, at, at Tri City, when he was coming out, and he would run, I would run the steps with him every once in a while. Because in the in, early in the afternoon, we'd get over there early. I'd get over there early just to hang out. And I see Joe running. I said, Joe, let me go a couple steps with you, a couple sections with you. All right, no problem. <laughs> and, and to have him pitch a no hitter last year for his hometown San Diego Padres, and he won the um, the fifth game. Uh, in the 2017 series against the Dodgers, uh, with a walk-off home, uh, a walk-off base hit by J.D. Davis, and and it, it was just really stuff like that that really um, makes you really cool. And and Jose Altuve told us a story um, after when he first came up here, um, when he was a little kid in Venezuela. Um, his dad sent him to a tryout camp with the Houston Astros in Venezuela. And Jose was a young kid. He wasn't very tall. And they sent him home. You can't play, kid. Go home. And um, he told his dad what happened. And his father said, you go back there. You show them what you got. He went back there. 
and he kicked ass and took names, and look where he is today. But he told that story. And wow. it's just amazing in the minor leagues how well you get this. Tony Kemp, who's playing for the Oakland A's right now, Tony Kemp came up here in Tri-City, and he was a, just a le- small lefty hitter, base hit, base hit, base hit. He makes the, Astro, makes the Astros, wins the a championship with them, uh, gets traded. But I saw him after, I, in fact, I interviewed him in 2018, um, right after our championship season, uh, right after the a- Astros won. And uh, what a great guy to interview. And it was just a real, it's like, follow him. He's doing okay. He's not batting as big as, but he's playing all different positions for the uh, Oakland A's. And he's another wonderful gentleman that, that has played and, and the desire to play and just really cool. Oh, wow. Hey, so uh, let me ask you a question. Let me ask you, who, sure. what one minor league play did you look at and, and enjoy so much in all your travels throughout those leagues and everything? Well, I've told this story. I'm always prepared to tell this story. Good. It, because it, it really shows you that you don't know who you're talking to until time goes by. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, in the California League, it, um, I, I go to every team, and, um, but very few players, it wasn't a first-year entrance league most of the time. Mm-hmm. So there were very few players for me to see on any given day. But mm-hmm. um, one time I uh, I approach a guy who's on my list, and I tell him the story. I said, my name is Ralph Tycho. I'm with Topps Baseball Cards, and I'd like you to sign a contract that guarantees you money when and if you make the big leagues. Mm -hmm. And the kid looks at me. He's, I'm 5'10", wiry. This guy is 5'10", wiry guy. Not not the kind of guy that you'd expect to be in the big leagues. And he looks at me and he says, when and if... I'm going to make the big leagues, not when, and not if, but when. And he looked at me, and he was pissed at having <laughs> um, So I said, um, well, nice to meet you, Robbie Thompson. Um, I, oh. uh, I hope you do, and I wish you a lot of luck. Um, now, you spend the day with the club when you when you're um, out there. It's not just signing the new players. Right. It's uh, talking to the guys who have signed, answering questions, schmoozing with the coaches uh, on behalf of tops. All those things that are so horrible for me to do. So, <laughs> um, job of a lifetime, believe me. I'm so sure it was. About uh, three hours later, I bump into Robbie Thompson coming on or coming off the field. And I said, uh, thank you. He says, for what? I said, I will never again use the expression when and if. I will assume you're going to make it until you, you don't. He puts his arm on my shoulder and he goes, Thank you. Whoa. Whoa. Uh, um, And uh, as you know, I'm in the Bay Area, so I got to watch him. uh, Oh, how cool was that? uh, Yeah. And that was my best interaction. And um, it wasn't necessarily an easy one. So, um, but that's the one I, I remember and, and that um, is really, really neat. And then, you know, you, you have all these things, whether or not it's triple A or double A, or single A. But think about this. Back when when we were kids, you get the sporting news, 
on a Tuesday oh, yeah. afternoon. I'm reading and in the back sporting news, you. right, and you're looking back. So you had the D League, right, the C right. League, the B League, Single A, Double A, Triple A. Think of all those players and managers that managed in that whole scenario. And they had the same type of leagues as we discussed, the Appalachian League, New York Penn League, the Midwest League, Florida State League, you know, all these leagues. And you had so many players, and you never know who might come up and who maybe might not just an average player that makes the major leagues. And that's why I think the fans here had liked so much of the Astros because they were they were young players, either got out of college, signed out of high school, or they had extended spring training, and then they were brought down to these leagues. But now with this independent league, I admire these guys. Number one is because they played Major League Baseball. They were affiliated in Major League Baseball. And for some reason, they're not there yet. But they have the desire and the wherewithal to say, you know what? I'm going to take the road less taken. I'm going to keep playing because I love the game and there's a possibility that that might happen. There was a guy on our team 2017 when we won the team. His name is Oscar Campos. He was a catcher. And he won the championship. And at, as I was on the field as soon as they won, and I saw him crying on, his, on the trainer's shoulder. And I said, what happened? He goes, he was so overjoyed because his mother passed away a couple months earlier, and he, 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 he designated that game for her. And Oscar Campos was on the Astros, and then when the pandemic came, he was cut. He stayed in the United States, worked in the wintertime, doing some painting and stuff like that, came back to our team last year in the beginning of last year. In the middle of the year, he was hitting like 320 with a number of home runs, who picks him up? The Brooklyn Cyclones. Oh, wow. For the Mets. So these really things, cool. that's why this independent league, and that's why the short season A ball or, uh, you know, double A and, and long season stuff, I, I got a better appreciation for everything that the guys, how they play the game, how they're trained by their managing, the trainers that, that go there, they, they're moving up as well. I know a couple of those guys that they're moving up and they're in, in, in higher leagues now. So they're getting there. I met one young girl who's a trainer, who's an athletic trainer who, who works for the Astros two, two years ago, just before the pandemic. She's one of the few women in, in, in that type of position. So you never know who you're going to run into. Absolutely. Uh, and, and, I don't want to, and the seats behind home plate, you know, one twentieth of what a seat like that with a family would cost in MLB, and yet these you get this for the kids, you get the same quality, hitting, fielding, watching the pitchers pitch, but you're up close and personal. Very close, as opposed to uh, being in the, in the grandstand and what have you. Uh, no bad, no bad seats in minor league ball, and. Amen. Uh, I, I want you to hope to get a copy of this to Manfred and see it, it would tell show him what he's trying to do and what he's destroying. Um, I, 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 it's crazy because minor league baseball had a president of all minor league baseball. They would have and the leagues would have different meetings. Now everything is under one umbrella. MLB is over the whole minor league scenario now. And, right. and that, that's, you know, um, it's not minor, uh, it, it's minor league baseball, but it's owned by MLB. And there are different ways now that this is run with a uh, robo umpires um, looking the way they, they do things in, in uh, if there's extra innings and stuff. Um, it's it, you know how they step off the mound now and have to throw to first base and they, all of this stuff is being predicated on on what MLB is doing and how they're going to interface that maybe down the road in 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 the in the big leagues. Who knows? You know. Yeah. 
Well, the good news I've heard recently is that the pitch count thing is working and it's taking mm-hmm. works off, off the game. So um, there are some good news, uh, you know, some good things that happen yes. with change. But I'm a traditionalist and um, uh, I, I just feel sorry for the kids coming up who don't have what we had at the sporting news, for instance, uh, um, it's um, the changes are not always for the better. Let's. I, I couldn't wait for Tuesdays to go into the newsstand where I lived in Richmond Hill, Queens, to get paid twenty five cents to get the sporting news, and yeah. and that to me was was the ultimate of learning who baseball players are how they're moving up. There were stories about certain teams and highlights and stuff. But I, I, I didn't give reflection to say, what if I went to a minor league game then? Because Shea Stadium was right there, you know, and it was easy to get to. It wasn't too much to go into a game at the time. So it wasn't great. But I would say, all right, these guys are in the minors. They're coming up. But I didn't know anything about how the construction of a minor league position in games are played. And you said about the time clock. Yeah, that would be cool even in MLB, I think. Down the road, I think that would be a, a needed ad because the games are running a little longer and there's timeouts. You step in the batter's box, you step out, step off the mound, and you're playing games with the batter. And it, to me, it's, it's just get in and hit, stay in the box, and then throw the baseball, you know? Right, and I'm hoping, too, that that uh, designated runner at the end of uh, – uh, the tenth inning, or the, whatever it is, or at the beginning of the tenth inning, extra innings yep. is eliminated down the road too. Um, well, maybe if they have a pitch clock and the game goes fast, maybe that's what they might want to do. You know, because the game's going to be moving along a little bit. But to to me, it, it, when you go to a minor league game now um, and, and seeing um, how the game is played. Uh, how the team interacts with the fan base between innings, uh, like in all minor league scenarios, um, it, it is good, whether it be independent league or whether it be, um, you know, professional affiliated baseball. Uh, it is something that the fans locally will, you know, in these, in these areas where the ballparks are, go to the games. And we had at one time with the Astros, the Tri-City Valley Cats were averaging – a little over 90-something percent attendance for three or four years in a row. And we have a 4,500-seat stadium. And at one time on July 4th, because we would have, you know, July 4th games, we had 6,000 people there. We had more time. One time we had more people in the stands than the Miami Marlins. Well, um, not to talk about me, but the Portland, Go ahead. the Portland Rockies uh, had a class uh, short A league, and they were playing in a Triple A team, a Triple A stadium, and yeah. they broke all attendance records for the the two years that they played. Uh-huh. And I did. It isn't yet out. It, it isn't yet on the internet, a, um, a video documentary about that Portland Rock routine. And, How cool um, is that, man? That is... That was, yeah. Um, I've had so many, so much experience with the minor leagues that my memories far outshine the memories of my memories of the major leagues. And uh, that's hard to do. Um, and I, I, you know, I, I have a, a side of that where um, I still will keep in reference to the younger years when we were kids growing up in, in, in New York and stuff and taking the train to either Yankee Stadium or Shea Stadium or even the Polo Grounds and or Ebbets Field, as, as my dad and I took there for 1956 for my first game. And the, the, the thing that I think is important, though, is how the players play the game. 
And whether it be in the minor leagues or the major leagues, the experience level grows and grows and grows, but you can see the passion of every player that plays the game with, and, 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 and the competition that they do uh, for each other as teammates uh, to win the game and to better themselves and the training that goes into that now with a little bit more analytics. We have a, a, a thing up in the upper, you know, in the behind home plate, the stat tracker or whatever they call it, they can see rotation of the ball, where the pitch was called. And so they go over it with the hitter. Here's where you miss the pitches on the outside over and over again. But, you know, you look at the inside, man, you're pulling the ball pretty good. You're hitting fastballs and curveballs on the inside. You're missing it up and in or the outside. And and that's how uh, the players are more synchronized into these analytics um, with lift and drive and speed off the bat. But, on occasion, you, you do see the players go in the opposite field if, they, if the pitch is outside or, or, you know, laying down a bunt here and there. And, and that's still part of this uh, game of baseball that these players are learning in the minor leagues to bring up that, that uh, experience to the major leagues. Boy. Hey, Dan, thanks for a great show. That's Man, this is really cool. And, uh, you know, you got to come back to New York. You know what I'm talking about, right? Forget about it if you don't, you know? Uh, yeah, I'll come back there, but, you know, we got to get some pizza. We, <laughs> we, got, we got a pizza with some pe- pepperoni on it, you know? <laughs> All right, my friend. Thank you. Thank you, Ralph. I, uh, come back again if you if you like it. Well, enjoy. <laughs> yeah, let's do it. I'll give you a... You know, a heads up on a, on a Monday and everything. I do a little working over at the museum sometimes on Monday at the Norman Rockwell Museum. So whenever you think you want to discuss something down the road, let me know. And I look forward to it. And, you know, and I, the want, game- to hear, I, and I want to hear from you what you want to discuss. So if you have okay. something that's burning, uh, you always have an open mic here. Well, the next, the next time, last night I went to an induction ceremony of the New York State Hockey Hall of Fame. And it was in Troy, New York, and they induct people that made a difference in New York State hockey. And some of the inductees were Mark Wells, Jack O'Callaghan from the 1980 team, uh, Bobby Nystrom was talking about Clark Gillies, who just passed away, Butch Goring was there, um, and, and a number of college coaches. And, and they have this. So down the road, I'll, I'll give you a heads up when this is going to be, and I, I can talk more about it down the road. How's that? And we will bring in my co-author, George Grimm, who wrote two or three Ranger books. And oh, I would you, like let's you, do that. I would like you to meet him. He would oh. enjoy your company, and we'll do that on the air the next time we speak. That'd be great, because there was one time from 1962 to 1968, I never missed a Ranger home game. Well, well, so uh, we, can, we were at, we can, we were at uh, the same game. We were at the same games. Um, God bless you, baby. <laughs> um, I, can't, I can't wait for you to meet George. Just That'd be great, just let me know, and we'll do it, man. Okay. Thank you, Dan. Thank, Thank you for you. listening, everybody, too. It's the Comfortably Zone Radio Network. Um, I enjoyed this one particularly. Uh, Thank I enjoy you. them Thank all. You, Ralph. But uh, this was great. Thank you again, Dan. Thank, Happy thanks, trails. Uh, Happy trails, everybody. And adios. Frozen rolls. <laughs> the proceeding has been a Comfortably Zoned Network production. You are advised to keep your dreams wet, your humor dry, your children and grandchildren out of military recruiting offices and off the laps of clerics who wear dresses. Thank you for listening, everyone. Happy trails.